show them. If you awaken from this illusion, persistence of vision. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Persistence of Vision podcast, inspiring conversation. You are very welcome here among us geniuses. Hello, folks. It's Lance Fever Myers. And I'm LB Dio. For Persistence of Vision Publishing, if you want to check us out online, that website is pov-publishing.com. If you go there, you can see and read beautiful work by Juan East Myers, W. Joe Hoppy, Justin Booth, loads of others. There's comics by world-class uh, uh, comic or sequential art artists, as I like to call them, uh, by Walt Holcomb, um, Shannon Wheeler. Uh, loads of others. So it's a really great, there's a tons of content there. Go check it out. That's pov-publishing.com. Woo! And today we are extremely excited to have the guest of the year, Mr. <laughs> Carl King, who is a polymath, uh, multi-talented, multidisciplinary, multimedia superstar. He is a creative juggernaut. That's right. He's a filmmaker. He's a composer. He's a writer living in L.A. He's a musician who's worked with Weasel Zappa and Virgil Donati and many others in the prog rock world. Uh, he's released several successful rock albums under various names. Uh, I still so don't understand why you would call him a creative juggalo. <laughs> juggernaut. Juggernaut. Oh, juggernaut. <laughs> he knows how magnets work. So, he, and not only does he know that, he knows uh, how to write. He's written uh, books, both fiction and nonfiction. He's uh, uh, lately creating, um, uh, focusing all his writing energy on crafting an episodic animated series. And how do I know that? I know that because I am the one doing all the animation for his recent work. So, let's talk to Carl. Carl, how you been, man? Hello, this is me. I'm Carl. Hello, Carl. So happy to have you. So Carl and I have been working together on various projects for a decade now, and we only very only met for the very first time about a month ago when I went to L.A. for a screening of one of my films, and he came out, and we finally saw uh, Face to Face. Um, so, Carl, tell us how it is that you and I came to work together for the first time. We came to work together because I was dabbling in flash animation and I wanted to understand how it worked. And I was watching some sort of flash animation gallery website where they, it was just some blog where some people had posted links to flash animators. And I saw your clip of Skip and Lester and I was blown away. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought the writing was hilarious. It was just this short little sketch with two characters but the humor was bizarre, and I loved the sketchiness of it. Uh, even though it was really professional, it still looked really rough in spots, and that's something that I've found is really cool about your animation and drawing style is you, you really know how to blend those two worlds of totally precise and also very sketchy. Don't soft soak him. Don't <laughs> soft soak him. Well, you know what's funny is when uh, when I first created that little short, and I think actually I think LB might have done one of the voices on. He definitely did one of the voices on one of the Skip and Lester things. But um, uh, when I created that, I never dreamed that it would lead to uh, such a, a fruitful creative uh, collaboration uh, that, that has lasted for ten years now. Yeah, and it was the it was the uh, clip called "I'm a Bathroom." <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a good one, right? That's what a, a premise. Place. I can't I like I still if someday if I can write a premise that funny. It's just it's just so silly and simple, but it's just perfect. Well, thank you. Like the moment where the guy is just like, you know, I'm a bathroom and the guy's just like, "What?" <laughs> he just yes. lets out this little what and he's just so confused. It's great. It's a great little moment. Well, thank you very much. And uh well, it's and that's what I think is really interesting about the way you've operated um for many of your projects is that you see work or hear work by musicians or, or artists that you like, and you're not at all shy about reaching out to these people. Um, you've worked with many people where you, you were inspired by their work, so you reached out to them, and it's led to a lot of fruitful collaborations. Is that right? Can you tell us about that? Well, I think that it came from starting out growing up in a small town in Florida as a 20, 21-year-old kid 
and not having any access to anyone or anybody that does anything professionally. I just had my weird friends. And to be able to grow beyond that, I needed to somehow get you know, uh, some other people to work with me who were professionals. And then I realized, at least for me, it was very easy. Once, like I, I would just you know, send an email or send a letter and tell them I had a project and here's an amount of money I can pay you. And they'd be like, great. Okay. And it, it, uh, it never occurred to me before that, that you could just call up or hire a professional and they'll do the job. So I think that that's what could limit you if you think, well, how would I ever get Virgil Donati on my record? Well, I, I emailed him and I paid him and he did it. So these are these are people who do things professionally and they're happy to get the work as long as it's not some project that's going to be embarrassing to them or tr- or screw up their reputation. So you know you can generally hire. It's I I, I think you can you tend to get just about anybody <laughs> as long as you know you can afford them. Well, I think you know there there might be some truth to that. Um, but number one, I think it takes some guts to actually get up the nerve to say, I'm going to call up this person or I'm going to reach out to this person and hope that they'll, um, you know, agree to work with me. But I think it also takes a little bit of talent because like what you just mentioned, as long as it's not going to you know, embarrass them or whatever, I think these, these people that you've worked with, uh, a lot of them can be choosy about who they, you know, decide to, to record with. And I think it's, it, it's a testament to your talent in both your writing skills and your just your basic your all your ideas that uh they must be pretty strong to uh you know to have this follow through with all these different But I people. think I didn't but but I just want to say that I don't think I had really I don't know if I had confidence I felt like my life is going to go nowhere if I don't <laughs> if I don't get somebody to play on my records who can play the stuff. So it was desperation. And so it was, Desper- <laughs> Yeah, it was like it's either this or nothing. So what what is there to lose? I'm going nowhere. So I may as well try to get Virgil so tell us about that, though, your, your roots in music. You're a bass player, is that right? Yeah, I started out as a guitar player and sort of a bass player. I, I, enjoyed, I enjoy physically playing the instrument of bass better, although I think like a guitarist, I think, more often. Um, and I got into composition and studying drums and percussion and music theory and all of that stuff in college. And so I think of myself as a composer, but my... You know, my main instrument that I feel comfortable playing is bass. Gotcha. And how does that lead into to, to writing? Because you've done a lot of that as well. Well, I guess I got into writing at the same time. I've, I, I, as I was doing music, I wasn't making any money in music. So I got into working in graphic design. And then I got into writing some stuff for a magazine called Inc. 19 out of Florida. That was a regional magazine. And that actually gave me the opportunity to interview tons of bands like Ween and Steve Vai. And that, in a way, that, that gave me the, also the realization that, hey, you can actually get a hold of these people and talk to them if you try. Um, so that's, that's how I got into writing, is writing record reviews, writing interviews. And if you look back, the writing on them is just horrible and immature. Uh, <laughs> but that, you know, that, that's where I was able to say, hey, I'm a writer and I have a business card with Inc. 19 magazine. So I got into writing that stuff. And then, and then that led into some screenplay type writing where I was trying, trying to write for animation and buying books about how to write for animation and then finding you. Fantastic. I guess lately you've been doing the writing for um, like an episodic kind of a thing. How how does that change? How does that process change, you know, from what you were doing before? When you get into writing for, you know, animation and things that are going to be happening while a viewer is watching it, there's a subconscious rhythm and pacing that becomes very important. And that's where music also helps that sort of thing. Um, and also structure becomes very important, like a... a a rhythmic structure. Uh, you can't, you know, you, you can, you can bend the rules a little bit, but there's still, it's kind of like one minute is one page and one scene is one page in animation kind of, kind of thing I try to stick to because otherwise it just feels wrong to me. So the last thing that we did together that actually did come out was a pilot for uh, what you were envisioning as a series called the Oracle of Outer Space. 
And uh, yes. that can be seen by viewers. Everyone out there listening right now, go to your Google and type in Oracle of Outer Space, and you will see this piece that Carl and I created together. And it has since won several Telly Awards, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful Whoa. piece of work. I'm really happy with it. I'm really proud of it. Um, Here's a fact. Here's a fact. Yeah, it came out pretty cool. I have never won an award in my life. <laughs> what? Never. Oh, come on now. No, I'm going to win an award for this episode right here. Yeah, well, I, I think I should win an award <laughs> just for being me. Well, I'll give you that award. Oh, I love it. Absolutely. So tell us, okay, so what, what was your experience like with the Oracle of Outer Space? What did you learn creating that, and what's your next project going to be like? Oh, boy. What did I learn from the Oracle of Outer Space process? Let me see. Well, there was a rough structure. It was a three-act, three-scene sort of structure. Uh, but the problem was all of the dialogue was so nonsensical and non sequitur. It was like you could relate one line to the next line, but then the line after that would take it in a completely different direction and make no sense. So it was this problem of going to crazy town, which is a concept, a concept that's taught in, um, the upright citizens brigade school of comedy. Um, where, you know, you walk into the room and you start doing an improv scene and I have a crazy hat on and I'm flying through outer space and I'm a horse and, uh, and it's just too complex of a compound thing. So you need this base reality most of the time so that you can then break that base reality. And so I learned that the hard way, making the Oracle of Outer Space because uh, that was it did not come out the way I expected it to be. So I'm taking all of that uh, and applying it to writing That Monster Show, the next project. That Monster Show is the next project. And when can we expect to, uh, to, to see that come together? It is a struggle, as you know, to sit down and write these things. Um, so I have good days and bad days of writing it. Um, I'm hoping I, I was... I think I was expecting the date to be like January of two, of 2020, right? This coming January. I was hoping, but we shall see because it's uh, a lot of work and I would avoid using the term world building, but that's what I'm doing with it. And, you know, when you watch Twin Peaks and you are introduced to so many interesting, colorful characters, trying to do that sort of thing with that monster show. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I'm taking a dozen characters and I'm spreading it out across, you know, five. I'm going for five episodes right now, by the way. I was originally going for eight, but I just started realizing this is really difficult to uh, spread it out for that long in a way. Um, but what I'm doing is doing a ton of psychological profiles on the characters and, you know, setting them up with a problem. And then by the end of that arc, they have to have addressed that problem in some way, either overcoming it or having it overcome them and having a change take place and having it paced out in an interesting way over five episodes and then having characters that complement that person's problem with their own problems. So it just kind of all folds together and fits nicely like a, a puzzle. So, well, it, I mean, it doesn't right now, but it's still very difficult to try to map all of that out for all of these characters. And, you know, slotting all these things together of like, well, I still need a character that does this. I need a character that's this type of person. How, what is that person going to be? And then you go through your day and maybe you are at the gym or something like that, or you're at the grocery store and suddenly you see someone and they say something, you're like, ah, that would be perfect for that kind of person that, that like, let's, let's, you know, okay. And then, so, you know, I write down the notes and then, you know, I've got pages and pages of just notes on all the possibilities for these characters and what their personalities and stories are about. And then just making that all balance out and make sense over five episodes. And maybe I may or may not be putting way more work into it than people usually do. I don't know. But all I know is I watch when I watch a TV show, I get very frustrated that at the end or, or a movie that these things didn't pay off or make any sense and there was no resolution and it was like why did we ever watch that huge sequence of something that didn't didn't fit and that's you know probably because there were 12 people writing it and there were producers saying change this or change that and yeah we need a scene where it does that and and then at the end it's just like okay we made it to the end of the season now what do we do right right 
So I'm trying not to paint myself into a corner either. And, and that's why I'm writing five episodes at once instead of writing a pilot. And then like, oh, great. Now I already, that character is that way. What do I do with it? I, like, I need to change this character to fix this problem. Yeah. Uh, this writing problem that I'm having or whatever. Uh, and I see that in a lot of shows too. You go back and watch the pilot and they're nothing like what the show ends up being uh, because they haven't quite figured it out. So I don't want to suffer from not figuring it out before I go full speed into it. That's an interesting thing that you bring up though, you know, that, that artistic endeavors like writing, especially in, in this case, the way you're talking about it, there, I, I think there has to be a balance struck between letting the, the work inform you as to what it needs to be and you know guiding it and and planning ahead you know what i mean like yeah these things yeah these sort of things happen yeah i mean you'll be writing a sentence uh, as you're writing the screenplay portion of it after you get all the notes and research done you'll be in the middle of a sentence and like oh wouldn't it be oh that's what this character has to do okay now let's go back and fix right all of the other stuff to make it fit so it's constant revisions and reimagining and almost rebooting your own show over and over as you go Right, and I want—I definitely want the time and freedom to reboot it in my own in my own uh, laptop before it gets to that point where people are watching it, and then I'm rebooting it in the second episode. Makes sense. Well, Carl, the, I got to say that yeah. that sounds too hard. <laughs> so yeah, if you could tell us an easier way to do it, <laughs> we would be grateful. No, actually, I think uh, I, I think what you're saying is 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 that exactly the fun part. It's the puzzle piece. It's it's the yeah. it's sort of like um, yeah, crafting something that feels like it's always been there. Um, and that and that's where you know like the revisions come in. You something hits you and oh, this is what the character's going to have to do. Now I've got to go backwards and rewrite certain as- aspects, and it becomes this kind of puzzle that you're fitting all the pieces yeah in. i was watching some twin peaks uh in the past couple of days and uh that's an amazing example of how a show can contain multiple storylines and all of these characters that fit together perfectly like in the example of if you watch the characters of bobby briggs and his dad i guess general briggs it's this insane pairing of this very stiff general and then this totally rebellious teenager, and it's just hilarious to watch this duo together. And if you watch throughout the show, you end up, you watch all these storylines. It's all these amazing pairings. So that's sort of the kind of thing I'm trying to do is uh, create this tense energy between characters so that their problems, uh, you know, their extremes all collide well, that sounds uh, uh, phenomenal. I'm really, really eager to uh, to sink my teeth into that one and to be the the I animation think. guy on this project. I really, really did enjoy working with you on Oracle of Outer Space, and uh, I think it's a great piece of work. And so I'm just really eager to see what you come up with next. Yeah, thank you. I think it uh, should be pretty cool once I get through all of this struggle of writing it. But uh, but are you enjoying the process? I I would say no, I'm not enjoying the process. <laughs> I mean, I enjoy the idea of doing it and I enjoy having the final project or the final product, but definitely don't enjoy the days of sitting there and just like, "Oh, what do I do?" you know. So that's the interesting. The typical writing, you know, kind of workflow of of pacing around and hating yourself until it's done (laughs) how do you how how do you relate to that lb do you feel like the creative process is fun or do you feel like you're driven to do it because the the end product is what you're after that's a great question i think that uh it's like you're saying carl the uh the moment that you come up with the next idea that you can execute it becomes fun and then you you finish up executing that idea and you realize you have to come up with the next idea <laughs> and it may just be the next paragraph i mean let's face it and uh, and then it's not so fun it's 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 pretty daunting i mean there's you don't have to have writer's block just to be daunted by that that blank space at the bottom of the page yeah uh, i had a, a a student i was talking to about 
because I'm I teach animation classes um, at UT and at ACC, and there was a I'm constantly trying to talk to the the students about what you have to do to trick yourself into being creative. Because I mean, it really is sometimes a matter of just kind of like getting to know yourself enough to to know where those roadblocks are and trying to outsmart the the, the roadblocks that you are constantly putting in your own way. And one of the things that he said was, uh, "Oh, I, when I start out in animation, I convince myself it's just going to be terrible. It's going to suck, and not to worry about it." It's it's just from the outset, I know it's going to be garbage and I'm not going to stress. I'm just going to start. And then throughout the process, he's, he, can't, he doesn't let himself, uh, you know, like settle for the crap that he's <laughs> set out to create and it eventually becomes better. I thought that was an interesting way to approach it. Yeah, it's true. And that's why they talk about having a vomit draft where you just <laughs> right. write it as fast as you can and it's horrible. And now we take it and we improve on it. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's just a very long process of it being wrong and terrible until it's finally right. <laughs> or in my case, the vomit draft gets worse as I rewrite it. <laughs> the dry heave draft. Yeah, it just gets worse and worse. <laughs> so why do we do this? Why, if, if it's so excruciating, why? Why are we doing these creative things? Well, we like the, the initial idea and we like the final product. At least that's what it is in me, in, in my case. Uh, or at least we hope to like the final product. Right, yeah. We were, you were talking about the the experience of working on characters and you see a person in real life and you think that characteristic uh, is going to go perfectly with this character. Do you find, as I do, that the a lot of the pleasure of creating something like a book or a script comes from the fact that you're always doing it, that you, when, you're, when you're walking around, when you're reading a book, when you're watching TV, no matter what, you're always, uh, your mind is always thinking of ways to incorporate whatever you've just learned about or experienced into the writing. Yeah, and, and that's, that, that is one of the more fun parts of it because it's almost like it just wrote itself in a moment when you just suddenly saw something that you could plug in. Right, um, but right. I also have that experience when I collaborate, and right now I'm not really collaborating with anybody writing this whole thing, uh, but that, that also adds a level of enjoyment when you can just enjoy something that someone else wrote. Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, I definitely have done projects in the past where it was, felt like it was dead in the water, and then I brought in some other people, and they just made it so fun uh, and saved projects for me. Um, but yeah. Uh, it's like you you know you wander around with your radar dish open just looking for something and you, you know you wait in the back of your mind you know you're receptive to the idea appearing and then you'll just be you'll suddenly be struck by a person or an object and there it is that was the answer <laughs> to it you know well, it almost gives you a retroactive justification for whatever you've just done like you know, hey I, I i was i thought i was wasting my time watching some dumb tv yeah. show but I got this brilliant idea from it, and now it's almost like I was doing research the entire time. No, it's totally true. I mean, wh when I'm writing, when I'm technically writing, sitting here, I'm sitting here with my laptop, just going through Wikipedia pages for hours and hours, and sometimes they lead to a realization or something, and sometimes it just is a dead end, and I'm like, well, I just read Wikipedia for four hours and nothing <laughs> happened. But, you know, some, it's, it's just like endless, like hitting your mind with something new of like, click on this link and see what that goes to. What does this bring to mind? Okay, it's like flashcards or something. That's or like an inkblot test or what, what is it called? A Rorschach, Rorschach test? Yeah, yeah. So I find Wikipedia really useful for that. So in addition to Wikipedia and, and your own observations throughout the day, what, who are your other inspirations? Who are, the, who are the writers who you aspire to be like? I guess I think of people like Alan Moore or something like that. Mm, okay. Um, but I'm more motivated lately by just seeing writing fall on its face and being like, oh, they I could have done better than that. Mm. <laughs> that is and, a kind of like, inspiration. Which, which is kind of a delusion in the first place, but... Um, but it still helps me to think like, oh, here's, here's a, a bad example of something I saw or watched on TV or Game of Thrones ending. You know, I watched that thing and I'm just like, wow, okay, that's what I need to not do. Mm. So it's, it's things to not do. Right. Interesting. So why animation? Why animation? Um, first of all, I like the aesthetic and second, uh, I'm, I have this big fear of working with people and what they will do to my <laughs> pro project if they're 
you know, I just always assume that adding people is a bad idea and that bringing in more people, they're just going to try to screw things up. And that, that's maybe my own bias and my own fears. Uh, but that's why I just, I love having total control of, of how everything ends up looking. Like if I was running around with a camera, you're just the victim of everything (laughs) of, of lighting and schedules and people's moods and, and just so many physical things. And with animation, the, I'm just a victim to Lance. (laughs) It's like (laughs) the only, the only limitation there is what I can think of and what I can make Lance do. I like it. I like so it. It's great. There is no limit to what you can get Lance to do. I can tell you that. It's a longtime friend of his. Fantastic. I think that's a, a great um, time to, to launch into our speed round here. Um, so we have a battery of questions that we ask every guest, and um, you have to go as fast as you possibly can in answering. So here we go. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Here we go. First question. When was the first time you remember falling in love with a book? I don't know if I would call it falling in love, but I would call it having an intense obsession, but that was Communion by Whitley Strieber, and it scared the shit out of me for decades. Nice. Good one. What, what is that one about? It's about a guy who had alien abduction experiences and continues to have them supposedly to this day and has been uh, expanding his connection with aliens. Fantastic. Has a book ever changed your mind? Uh, I, I, the majority of the books I read are self-improvement books and all those cheesy sales and marketing and Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and, and, uh, Brian Tracy and all that stuff. That's and so, yes, I'm always trying to improve myself and change my mind. I, I am a type, the type of person I want to change my mind. I don't like my mind. So I, <laughs> I definitely want to improve it and change it. And, and do you, you find that that's useful uh, in your creativity to to be reading these self help books, or do you get ideas for your, or is it more like it helps you have the discipline and motivation to be creative? I don't really feel like it helps with. I don't know. Maybe it helps with some motivation and discipline, but uh, overall, I feel like if I can improve myself, that's more important anyway than the things I'm creating. But it, as a byproduct, it does improve the things I'm creating. I think, at least, I hope so. What if I told you, Carl, that you're already good enough? <laughs> That's, uh, I'll have to ask my therapist about that one. <laughs> well then, uh, that's a, a good segue into, has a book ever changed your life? Has it ever changed my life? I would say reading a bunch of Ayn Rand in high school got me through high school. Uh-huh. And it was something that I really needed at the time. And it's something I've since, uh, since moved on beyond okay beyond Ayn Rand good answer has a book ever made you cry communion by Whitley Strieber I would cry every time I saw just the cover painting out of fear somewhere around 30 (laughs) was it was was, were they tears of fear they were they were just overwhelm and a feeling of holy shit what's going on wow it just scared the crap out of me uh, (laughs) in every way on a deep level I love it. So, is um, there any anal probing in this book? <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> that seemed like an odd question, but I'm not sure it really was. Hey, name a book you've read more than once. A book I've read more than once besides is communion. right. Besides uh, the 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 art of thinking clearly by Rolf Dobelli, which I read over and over, and I still can't remember very much of it. So I have it on audiobook. I've bought multiple copies of it that I keep around and I have Kindle copies of it and I just keep reading it because this idea came up that if a book is really good, why not read it more than once or until it really sinks in? Of course. Yeah. It's going to take a long time for me to think clearly. Apparently the art of thinking clearly. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Interesting. I'll have to check that one out. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, but what makes you want to think more clearly? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh i you know what i i think i've always i've tried to be less human and more robotic throughout my life as sure. a, some sort of striving for perfection and i'm only in the past 24 hours thinking wow that's such a weird thing to do why do i want to do that because why is that such a likable trait but then i think of lieutenant commander data or spock and those guys are great well, what about r2d2 oh. <laughs> so i'm not really sure yet but but i do want to think better Great. I've always wanted to. 
of thinking clearly. Maybe because I think so unclearly. Aha. Well, think clearly about this. This last uh, one is the million-dollar question. I think we've only had one guest answer in the affirmative. Uh, do you have any poetry committed to memory? Only a very short phrase. Um, actually, two short phrases, and they both come from the same person. One is, small strokes fell great oaks, mm -hmm. which I think that that is such a great truth, and it's something to remember every day as you're working on a project. You know, you have to work on it a thousand times or 10,000 times before it's ever done, and you just have to keep at it on those little tiny improvements. And then the other one is life with fools consists of drinking to the wise man living's thinking. And they are both Benjamin Franklin. Nice. Fantastic. But that's that guy's got like books full of those things. So it's it's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, he's good. He's real good. Well, Carl, this has been fantastic. It's been delightful. Again, Carl King artistic creative juggernaut here who uh, I've been working with for the past decade on various projects and we only met for the very first time last month and it was a, a, a great great time um, that we had there in LA thanks for coming on and you know uh, readers aren't going to know this because we're not going to post our failed attempt but this was our second time doing this and I really appreciate you coming back and trying to get it right because we kind of flubbed the first recording but uh yeah the first time we I'm were looking recording. forward to the third time it's gonna be <laughs> better well i was gonna say the first time we recorded i i misheard lance and thought he called you a juggalo and it was very <laughs> embarrassing <laughs> so, so he just sabotaged the recording yeah, so that we had to trash that whole session <laughs> lance i also have to thank you for visually representing me for so many years because it's such a weak spot for me i don't have a talent for drawing and you have conveyed my ideas visually in an amazing way i've been able to go to conventions and show off your artwork on these huge banners and everything and it's, so it's just great absolutely and thrilled lb to do it. thank you also <laughs> well I, i'm very thrilled to do it thank you for having me and uh you have a website i'm quite sure of it what is your website it's carlkingdom.com c-a-r-l kingdom k-i-n-g-d-o-m although you can also reach it at Carl Kingdom. Dot com spelled D U M B instead ah, of D O M. Brilliant. Carl King Dumb Excellent. will also work. Excellent. Well, thank you for being on our show. Um, and uh, everyone out there, check out pov publishing.com. Go buy my book while you're at it. Uh, that's called Why So Much? Question mark. You can find that on Amazon. Look me up, Lance Myers, and the book is Why So Much. Check out the website. Um, we've got Good things on the horizon. I think we have uh, a book. I don't know if LB is ready to announce it yet, but uh, he'll have some, some work coming up soon. Are you oh, ready yeah. to announce? Of course I'm ready okay, to announce. Okay, bring it on. Tell my, us. My novel, The Goddamn Fool, is coming out in September, and uh, and by God, you know, it's going to come <laughs> out. So we're going to have a party and everything. Hooray! So, Melbourne hooray. Books. So, yeah, look for that and, uh, and read my, Why So Much While You're Waiting and, uh, and be amazed. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yes, we'll see you next time with Mike Signs, movie editor to the stars. Talking about Moby, Moby Dick. Dick. Yes. See ya. Thank you. <laughs>